my dad worked at Technicolor, and they had a preview matinee for the kids at uh, a theater in Hollywood. I saw it in 1965 at this matinee, and there was just a riot in the theater. Yeah, and they threatened to stop the screening if the kids didn't quiet down. Uh, oh, I loved it. I just loved it. There's a Beatles, are you kidding? This is history. I mean, the Beatles, uh, um, you know, are timeless. And this movie's timeless. And, you know, for future generations to be able to see this movie in the way it was intended to be seen and not in the state it was in was seemed pretty important. I was loaned a print of help back in the mid-1970s, and it was completely red and faded. And uh, I looked at it and said, God, I wish I could work on this film. Our goal on this film was not to change the movie and, and, and create something new. It was to restore what the, um, the cinematographer and the director had intended. It was a very difficult, challenging project. It was hard. There was a lot of work. Uh, and every time we turned another corner, we found more obstacles in the film. Just the amount of dirt and noise that we had to deal with uh, was astronomical. It's just like someone dragged film through sand or dirt, mm -hmm. and we get the end product. Step one is we wind through the material to find out what kind of physical condition the material is in. Then we go through and re-repair all the repairs. Uh, we take them apart, we put them back together. The splices that are coming apart due to dryness, we re-splice them. They age over time, just like the film. Um, the tape gets old, it gets, it gets slippery, because we have to use tape sometimes to repair the edges. Uh, one of the things that happens to the splices is over periods of time they get dry, and they have to be remade, because they'll, they'll pop, they'll break. So we basically make the show so that it will go through our equipment without exploding. Step two is to Cheryl. Cheryl times it for the first trial. A color timer is establishing a light point for the printers for each scene, shot by shot, so that the color moves, uh, flows smoothly throughout a, a movie and nothing stands out or blinks out at you. Color timing is known as grading, by the way, in England. Actually, grading is a better term than timing uh, because you're grading the color shot for shot. Any original negative is shot with several different cameras at several different locations at several times of, of day, developed at several times, several different times, several different exposures. So timing is a laboratory function in all motion pictures where you balance in photochemical printing the colors of each shot so that they match and they flow as a single unit. I load my corrections into the tape, which loads it into the printer and gives the light points to the printer. What this does where it says printer control system, is it takes Cheryl's timings using a, an old antiquated tape system, and it applies Cheryl's timings shot for shot to the material that we're manufacturing. And the lamp house is here. And these are, the, these are called valves. And what these do is open and close and regulate the amount of red, green, and blue light that reflects Cheryl's timings upstairs into the film, which is shot up through here and into the head. There. This is a wet gate panel printer, contact panel printer, that we use to print help on um, in various stages of the process. What this machine does is it duplicates exactly the original negative material uh, to modern day film stocks. And it, it's come in very handy for us, especially in a show like Help, which is 40 years old. Um, over the years, it c can collect quite a bit of surface defects and blemishes. And this machine will actually remove them while they're printing it. When light hits a film, like when you see it on a screen and you see scratches, what the light does is it hits the film, and when, it, when the light sees the scratch, it bends it. And so that causes a scratch. So what this does is it 
It fills with liquid, which fills in the scratches and allows the light to go straight through the film, thereby eliminating the scratch, the scratch of the surface defects on the material. The print that we manufactured, you know, that we made, is every bit as good or better than any print that was ever screened in 1965. If you ran our print, you would think it was gorgeous. If you looked at it on high def, you would be shocked. You're looking at it with a microscope on high def because you're taking some huge image where it's completely spread out and you're taking it and you're, you're compacting it into an image that's that big. From that HD uh, master, we then brought that up into our DRS environment where I'm sitting now, and we really started the painstaking work, the, the frame to frame to frame uh, cleanup of, of everything that should not have been in there from years and years of being on film and celluloid and the problems that you know we inherited. At the beginning of every morning or at the end of every day, we'd go to each other and go, hey, how far did you get? Hey, Todd, right. how many minutes did you get? He goes, or minutes. minutes. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, minutes. I got through 20 seconds. We decided that uh, it was full restoration, 90-minute project, that uh, we would split it up in half. And uh, I don't think we did heads or tails or anything, but I did the first half and Kevin did the second half. I think one of the things we had to decide on was what was introduced after the film was made and what was intended to be shown to the audience. And after we got past that, we were able to basically attack all the dirt and leave the dirt that was intended to be there or the scratches that the director wanted. The main title, uh, Richard Lester, the director, uh, it was supposed to, it's black and white and the rest of the movie is color. And it's intended to be kind of like surveillance footage of the Beatles. So it's supposed to have some dirt, maybe some scratches. So it was kind of tricky to decide how much dirt to take away. And another thing was it was projected onto a screen and the screen had imperfections on it too. That's so we right. had to decide, well, that's part of the screen. We can't take that out. That has to stay there. This before and after, and I'm tweaking my auto filter um, adjustments and parameters of how aggressive I want to attack it. Uh, there's a fine line between pushing it too far and not pushing it far enough. So if I go too far, then you might see part of John's nose disappear. Or if you don't push it far enough, um, there'll be more pieces of dirt. So there's a delicate balance there. A lot of the problems we ran into were the, just the mass amounts of flurries right, across right. faces. So we had to attack each and one of those one by one, which is an extreme task for anyone. Let's say that there's 24 frames in a second. OK, there's 1,440 frames in a minute. And that's what people see. So it's almost like one snapshot, one picture that someone takes. That is one frame. Once we get the movie into the box, into the, into the computer, we scene by scene try to work on the, the whites, the blacks, try to keep the blacks black, not too, too lifted, too milky, um, get the contrast just right, which is you know, the difference from uh, brightness to darkness, get a nice balance, get the skin tone just right, um, the saturation, which is the overall color value, how, how much color you have in the scene. This scene's a little bit flat. Um, there's some color inaccuracies uh, um, within the shots, um, possibly due to fading of the element over time. So this, I'll increase the contrast and you'll see, and it, it, it actually gets richer as you increase contrast. You can see that you know, you actually feel like you can see into the element as opposed to see like a haze. And that's the difference. So it's pretty dramatic when you do that. I also have window capability where, say we want to see, who's over here? Is that Paul? We want to get Paul dug out of this hole he's in over here. I can put him in a window and I can isolate that area and I, I can work within, inside or outside of these windows. I have multiple windows I can use for different areas. So as you can see, now we can see Paul's in the shot, where probably here it's kind of hard to see. So if we want to try to save the definition in the clouds, we can do that with a grad, just to 
pull this guy out. You sort of feel privileged working on a movie like this, um, something that's going to go go on and go down in history. I mean, people will be watching this for years to come, and uh, to know you had a part in that, it's. it's feels pretty good. I've been a Beatles fan since uh, my parents dragged me off to Shea Stadium in the early 60s and uh, was exposed to Beatlemania uh, and then sort of growing up with them on the Ed Sullivan show and you know my family used to sing Beatles songs growing up as a kid all the time and it was just a wonderful happy experience in our house to listen to Beatles music. Um, and to fast forward into my career a few years later to be able to work on the restoration of one of the, you know, the two movies that they did um, was just a great experience for us. To see it from the beginning when it first came to us and where it is now, is, it was a good feeling. What is a labor of love for me? It becomes a labor of love for them because if I have passion in a project, it's, it's catching. And it has been a passion for me to make it, you know, make it beautiful again.